Well, good evening, friends. Very grateful once again for your devotion to the Lord and for your commitment to Him on this first day of the week, especially in drawing closer to Him. It's a, it's a great delight and honor to be with you and to see you. And I do want to congratulate the new fathers who had a special day today, I'm sure, being with your family. It was a good day for us. But I was mindful of those who were newly... Um, what's the word? Not ordained, is it? <laughs> Not appointed, uh, whatever. Not discovered. But anyway, the new fathers this day and for the Father's Day, the first Father's Day for them. And I just was uh, mindful of them. But it's been a good day. Good day for all of us. In the book of Micah, we have the account of when this prophet was sent to both the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah, that they were, uh, let me see here, it's not showing up here, um, that he was a prophet who was a contemporary for, to Isaiah at the same time, and it's just before both of the nations would go into captivity, that Israel would eventually go into Assyrian captivity and Judah would go into Babylonian captivity. And we understand that the reasons for that was because of their idolatry and their lack of commitment to the Lord. And so Micah was sent to address both of them. And it says in Micah chapter 6 that as he's talking to the people, it says in verse uh, 1 through, or really 2 through 3 of Micah chapter 6, the Lord has a complaint against his people and he will contend with Israel O oh, my people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? Testify against me. For I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. And so God is asking them, what, what have I done to deserve this? Your lack of commitment to me. And as you keep reading in Micah chapter 6, the people, it is as if they respond, well, what do you want? What should we do? Should we give more? Is that, is that what you want from us? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And God responds in verse 8, which is probably the key to the whole book in Matthew, or Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, where he says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And that is just a really... What is it? Just stay it here. Can you still hear me okay? Yeah, we'll just do that. But it's just a good, concise response to what God wanted them to do and how God wanted them to view their relationship with him. And when you read that, I think that there is a lesson in there for us that we could probably ask the same thing. What does God require of you? What does God want from me? What kind of person does he want me to be? What kind of relationship does he want me to have with him? How does he want me to view my time on earth and going about my affairs in life? And in a very real sense, what he said to the people then is a message that we can still apply today, that we can still benefit from today. That these three principles that he lays out here are principles that are timeless for anybody who would walk with God and have a relationship with him. Because God never changes. His character is always the same. And so what does God want from you tonight? What does he want well, we can see one thing he wants you to do is he wants you to be a just person, to do justly, as he says here in Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. And that refers to doing what is right, what is fair, especially in your treatment of other people. Do the right thing. Do what is honorable and what love would express to somebody. And what a great message for today's time. You know, to do what's fair and what's right to other people and to not do evil to them. And really, when you go back and you read what he says in the old law of how he taught his people...
to live, you can see that the implication that it's just rooted in just doing what's fair, taking responsibility for your actions and being just in how you treat other people. I think of what it says in Exodus chapter 23 as he goes through and explains this in verses 1 through 8. Notice that he was teaching his people to be upright in their treatment of other people. Where he says in verse 1, you shall not circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil. Nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. You shall not show partiality to a poor man in his dispute. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. You shall not pervert the judgment of your poor in his dispute. Keep yourself far from a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not justify the wicked. You shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. So, and you can just keep going through all of that. And basically, he's just telling people, you do the right thing. You be fair in your treatment of one another. You take responsibility for your actions, but you show mercy to people. And that just, that will never go away. Anybody who would want to walk with God would have to have the same type of attitude even today because we can just see it all throughout the world. Came across a neat study of what they did with some dogs at the University of Vienna in Austria. And basically it was a, a, it was a study on, on how even animals can sense injustice. And these the, the people in the experiment would bring in dogs two at a time and set them before the person conducting the study. And what he would do is he would extend his hand to the first dog to ex expect the dog to, to shake the experimenter's hand and, and that dog would do so and then that dog would be rewarded with a treat. Well, the dog sitting next to it would have to do the same thing. He'd extend his hand to that dog and that dog would respond the same way, but he would not give that dog a treat. And this would go on. And after a while, the second dog, it didn't take long for the second dog to see what was happening and not even participate. Not even participate. Sometimes they would even turn away, not even look at the experimenter as he was doing this study because he was, even the animal could sense injustice. And they would not participate anymore after that. And that just goes to show, again, that even animals can see this. Even animals can realize what's fair and what's not fair, in a sense, in some settings. And how important is, is it for us today to hear this message? Especially in our society, where people are responding to one wrong by doing 24 other wrongs. How fair is that? How fair is it to do evil to other people who don't deserve evil treatment because of your anger towards some injustice at some other scenario that's not the way God teaches his people to think he wants us to be people who are fair in our treatment of other people you go back to what he said in Deuteronomy 16 where he taught his people again <clears throat> you you should be a person who's going to show equality regardless of your feelings toward the person in Deuteronomy chapter 16 notice where he says in verses 18 through 20, that you shall appoint judges and officers in your gates, which the Lord your God gives you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality, nor take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. You shall follow what is altogether just, that you may live and inherit the land which the Lord your God is giving you. And so in Micah chapter 6, the question is, what, what, what do you want from me? What does the Lord require of me? God says, I want you to be just, to do what is just. And I think we can all realize that that is still something that is so important today. Are you just in your treatment of other people, in your business dealings with other people? 
You know, all throughout the Proverbs, you'll have this statement come up that one of the things the Lord hates is an unjust weight or balance. Dishonest scales are an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. And you can imagine the time when they would use these scales and weights in the marketplace as they're buying and selling on the scene. And so either the consumer or the seller would have their weights and their scales and you could cheat the other person by using dishonest scales or dishonest weights. And what God was saying to his people is, I see all this and I hate it. It's an abomination to God for somebody to cheat someone else out or to dis, di, di, uh, be dishonest or misleading in your dealings with other people. So how can I be a just person? Well, here's a couple of thoughts, how we can always be just. We can be people who are just because we are people who are going to be content with whatever honesty brings us, with whatever fairness brings us. We're going to accept that, even if it may be a little. Sometimes you may not make the sale because you're fair and you're honest and you're just and you follow that which is right. Sometimes you're not going to have that extra increase from cheating other people. In Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 8, the Bible says, Better is a little with righteousness than vast revenues without justice. So it's better to have a little increase than to have a whole lot that is gained in, in a dishonest manner because that brings trouble, as he talks about earlier in Proverbs 15. So dishonest scales are an abomination. He loves it when people are upright and honest and right in all their treatment of other people. I think of what it says in James chapter 2, where he classifies this treatment of other people as the royal law. It's the supreme law, that you can't surpass this law in your treatment of other people because you are doing unto others what is right and what is fair. In James chapter 2, the Bible says it this way, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, do you want to be cheated? Do you want your stuff to be vandalized or stolen or destroyed? Do you want that? Do you want people to falsely accuse you or to pervert justice against you? Do you want that? Then obviously God is saying, well then, do that to other people. Show that kind of love toward other people. Show this expression of concern to other people. And it says at the very end of that verse, James 2 and verse 8, you do well. You do well when you live like this. God, what do you want from me? Well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be a person who is right, who's fair, who's just in how you treat other people. He goes to Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. He says, I want you to be a person who shows mercy, but who loves mercy. That's how he phrased it in Micah. That he's looking for a person who is going to love mercy. Now, I'm not going to read all this uh, in Matthew, where it talks about in chapter 18, verses 28 through 35. You recall the story you know, of a man who was forgiven so much by his master when he was pleading for his master to show mercy. His master forgave him that great debt. And then he goes out and finds somebody who basically owed him pennies compared to what he was just forgiven. And that guy was asking for mercy, and that person would not show the same pity. And so he was judged for that. And what we understand is Jesus was teaching in this parable the importance of being a person who forgives. Now I'm here to tell you that's hard to do. It's very hard to do. When somebody does wrong toward us or does an injury toward us, it, I, I know the, the, the impulse is let's let them have it back. You know, they did evil to me. I'm going to do this and compound it with interest. Okay, that's the attitude is let's give them back more than what they gave us. That's the, that's the tendency. And yet the Bible is t teaching us, and really God is challenging us, to be people who, ex who extend mercy to those who do evil to us. And here's how the Bible encourages us to think like this. The Bible teaches that we need to be people who go back and remember what God has done for us. In Titus chapter 3, the Bible says it this way in verses 3 through 5, because he reminds us of the fact that we were the person who had that great debt that we needed so much mercy on because we were just so wicked. 
And we were. Listen, some of us wouldn't even be here tonight. We wouldn't even be alive if it weren't for the mercy of Christ changing us and persuading us to take on a different life and a different outlook. Some of us wouldn't be here. But by the mercy of God, we have been shown a better life. In Titus chapter 3, it says in verses 3 through 5 that we ourselves were also once foolish. We used to be disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. We were all right there. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul is saying in this letter that you, you remember, you remember what God did for you. And so you and I need to be people who love mercy, not just show mercy, but we love mercy. And here's why. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And that will always be true. You're always a better person when you give. Especially when you give mercy and show mercy. <clears throat> and we can be people who learn to love it. Every so often when I'm in the drive-thru, you know, you, do, you, you pay it forward. I'm sure you may do that every once in a while. And I do. I, every once in a while I do that. Well, I, finally, I was the recipient of that recently. You know, I'm in line, and I place my order, and I get up to the window, and the person said, well, the person in front of you got this for you. And you would think my first reaction would be, thank you very much. But my first reaction was, oh, man. And the reason I said, oh, man, is because my order was $2.55. And had I known, <laughs> had I known, I would have stuck it to them. Had I known, though. But, but I, hey, you know what I did? I, I waved and I just thanked him so much because I was, I was appreciative. I was appreciative of that generosity and that gift. You know what it's like to be given something? You know what it's like to have mercy shown to you? But let's say we're not talking about that. Let's say we're talking about someone who needs to forgive us of something we said about them. Or something we've done that needs to be corrected publicly. Or the restoration of some relationship. Are we going to pay it forward? Are we going to show that mercy? Going to show that love? Going to show that kindness? Are we going to act like God at that prime opportunity where we have the moment to give somebody what they don't deserve? The Bible says in Psalm 37 that God wants people who love that. Who love to give to people who need help. And he won't forget us. In Psalm 37, the Bible says in verses 25 and 26, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends, and his descendants are blessed. Who's the person that's going to be blessed by God? It's not the bitter person, not the selfish, unloving, unkind person. It's that generous person who gives and gives and loves to show mercy. That's the person that is going to be blessed by God. God, what do you want from me? I want you to do what's right. Do justice in your treatment of other people. I want you to love mercy when you've been called upon to forgive. And then he says in Micah chapter 6, in verse 8, I want you to be a person who walks humbly with me. Now, if you go back and you... Look at all the examples in the Bible of people who were called either the friend of God or people who had a special faith in God. What you see over and over and over is that they were people who had learned to walk with God on a daily basis. And that, I think, is something God wants from us. I think he's a God who wants us to be people who walk with him, who think about him on a regular basis, and all throughout the day we're saying, I love you. I love you and I appreciate you. Much like that prayer was offered a while ago. Very same sentiment of that expression of devotion to God. Because it says in Amos chapter 3 and verse 3, Can two walk together unless they are agreed? And that's true. I mean, how can you and I be walking in the same direction unless we're walking in sync? Going in the same direction. And how can I walk with God unless I'm on the same page as Him? Thinking like He is. 
How can I walk with God without loving Him? One thing I hope that can be said of all of us before our time on earth is over is that through all the trials we were going through in life, one thing that's true is that we were faithful to God. That even though all these things happened to us and sometimes we were not what we were supposed to be, we got back up and we kept walking with God because we were faithful to the one we loved. The Bible describes in 2 Peter chapter 2 that it's possible for God's people to reach a point where they no longer walk with Him. And that's a very sad thing to, to think about. In fact, Peter says it's a much worse condition because it's a stricter judgment. When you had known God and you weren't faithful to Him, you're going to have a stricter judgment. In 2 Peter chapter 2, the Bible says this in verses 20 and 21. If after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it. To turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. Now that can take in the factor that your heart is hardened and so you're in a worse condition having turned away from the truth. That's a, that's a factor. But another factor is that we're going to receive a stricter judgment because we knew better. And so instead of going down that path, you know, of losing our faith in God, isn't it a more beautiful story to think about the loyalty of not abandoning our God, that we love Him, we're true to Him, and we're faithful to Him, even when others do evil against us. We don't give up on the person we love. You know, I read a, a, a sad story of a man who worked for the sheriff's department. This was a couple of years ago. In the aftermath of one of those hurricanes, and it was a area that was devastated and so he was out serving the community and while he was away from home he comes back to his place and somebody had broken into his house and killed his family and so in response to that he took his own life you know and you can read read a story like that and it's heartbreaking for that to happen to people who don't who nobody deserves that obviously but for him to experience something like that that here he is out serving other people, and then that happens to him. And so he gives up on life. You know, and I can see a parallel, though. You know, here we are serving other people, helping other people, and then somebody we know and love slanders us. Or something happens to us in life, and so we want to give up on the Lord, quit the Lord, quit the church, because of something that is happening to us in life. And yet God is calling us to be people who love Him, who walk with Him, who trust Him, who complete our faith in Him. And that's a great challenge for all of us. But if you can see how a man did not need to respond like that to some injustice to him in life, then you and I can have the same response in our relationship with God. What a sad tale it is when Christians give up on God, who quit God because of the trials they're facing in life. And so they never complete their faith. In Hebrews chapter 10, the Bible says in verses 38 and 39, The just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. A Christian woman told this story of how she went to see her parents one day and they had been married a long time and elderly at that point and it had reached a point where the woman needed some help the mother that is needed some help uh, even getting ready and so the daughter comes in one day and the father she sees the father on his hands and knees helping his wife get on uh, her I think maybe her stockings or something like that and she's witnessing her father do this. And her father responded by saying, it has been my greatest privilege in life to serve your mother. And then she, of course, the lady was telling that story and, and she was moved by it. And it's a very moving story to think about. But you know what's so beautiful about that story? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. 
That's what's so beautiful. It's for people to remain committed through life, throughout marriage, to be loyal to each other, to serve one another, sickness and in health. That's what's so beautiful about that story. It has been my greatest honor to serve your mother. Well, it has been my greatest honor to serve our father. Walking with God, loving God, loyal to him in all things. That's what God's looking for and that's what God deserves. But those who draw back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And so what does God want from us? Well, there's a lot of stuff. But according to Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, we can get a good commentary in one verse. He wants us to be people who are upright and fair. He wants us to be people who are merciful. And he wants us to be people who walk with him. And I hope you do. I know you want to. I want to as well. We have a great God who deserves our devotion. But you know, as this chart shows, there's one other thing he wants from you that if you haven't done this, is he wants you to obey the gospel. Because it's God's will that everybody learn the knowledge of truth and be set free from sin. That's what he says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 3 and 4. He wants you to learn the truth and be saved. And if you have learned the truth and you understand that you are not saved, well, he, you can know at this moment he wants you to be saved. He wants you to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and be set free from sin. And if you understand that, then we persuade you to humble yourself and come to your God who loves you in obeying this precious gospel of repenting of your sins, confessing your faith, and being immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. And if you don't understand that, then please let us have a moment with you to study that. But if you've done that or you need to make things right with God in a public way, please respond to him as we stand and sing.